Welcome to Oceanside Chat, Light Beyond Generations. This podcast was created to inspire, motivate, and provide insight through industry professionals sharing personal stories, career aspirations, and practical advice. In this episode, we spoke with Kobus Yusta, the co-founder and CEO of Syllable. Time to get your feet wet in the business world and join us down by the water as we have an Oceanside Chat. Season 1, Episode 4, The Soul of a Startup. Hello, everyone. Today is October 27, 2021, Wednesday afternoon. And this is our number four episode of Oceanside Chat, a podcast created for students and young professionals, amplifying leadership, innovation, technology, and entrepreneurship. Our guest today is Kobus Uista. Hey, Kobus. Welcome to the show. Hi, thank you for having me. Thank you for meeting our smart and curious students at UC San Diego. A little background before we get started. Kobus and I met at X, the moonshot factory at Alphabet, around 2014. Back then, my organization supported Kobus's life science project. We worked together on very interesting ideas and kept in touch ever since. Kobus might tell you more about those projects later in the show. So Kobus, as a host, I will ask you a lot of questions. And some questions are from me and many more, I hope, from our live audience and students. And to have more fun, I will also take one question from you. Are you ready to dive in? Yep, I'm ready. Great. So my guest last week was a mechanical engineer and a designer for physical products. He mentioned this. Everyone knows hardware products are hard to make. So you have a long list of software patents on LinkedIn, and I consider you as a software expert. So following the sentiment, what would you say about software? I've worked on both hardware and software projects over the years. At Google, I was a technical lead for a lot of the Android phones that shipped in the early days of Google Samsung Galaxy phones, the original Google Nexus phones before they became the Pixel phones. And it's correct, hardware is hard. It is a complex process to design and manufacture hardware. And if you work in a fast-paced environment like mobile phones, there's very little room to miss the schedule or the deadline or to make mistakes. I think the big difference between hardware and software is after you ship hardware, you can't really change it. If there's failure, hardware failure, then typically that means the device needs to be returned. But in software, you can patch it usually unless you have a bootloader issue or a firmware update issue, you're usually able to change it. And I think that's a double-edged sword. It makes it easier to fix things when it's obvious what's wrong, but because software is not a physical thing that you can touch, doing failure analysis on software is much harder than on hardware. It becomes more complicated. You may have seen the news that Tesla pulled some of their self-driving features. A lot of software these days are powered by machine learning models. And it's not always obvious what is wrong with that model and then going in and fixing it. And I've worked in various uh, hardware projects where failure analysis was a really important part of being compliant. And failure analysis is a mechanical process that you can go through to try to identify a problem. But in software, it's much, much harder. Mm -hmm. So if you were to pick one word to describe software, what would that be? Software is so diverse today. Pretty much everything has software in it, cars, refrigerators, watches, medical devices. I think instead of trying to pick a word, I think the way I would answer the question is, is there a is software like a pure engineering process or is there some creative component to it, some artistic component to it, some fungible component? And I think, yes, having had the opportunity to work on both hardware and software, I think product design and industrial design have a large creative component to it. And software, to some degree, is not always seen as similarly creative to industrial design, but I think it's equally challenging and gives you a lot of opportunity to be creative. Even back-end engineers, when they're building something for a database or a transactional system, there is a ton of opportunity to be creative and to solve the problem in many different ways. What advanced languages and development systems have given us is a pretty blank slate and a lot of control for a developer on solving a problem. 
And that in itself creates infinite solutions to product requirement or a market requirement or a user requirement. And that in part is why software is so challenging because there's so many ways to to solve a problem with software. Mm, I don't know if that's a good enough answer. No, that's beautiful. I love your answer. I probably wouldn't thought about the creative is the word you would pick, but you know, this makes perfect sense. Thank you for that. So I move on to the next question. We both worked at Google, which is a company constantly rated as one of the best place to work for. We then both left the company to pursue a new adventure in 2017. So if Google couldn't keep you, I wonder what is your absolute dream job? Well, maybe we should talk about why I left Google. I think Google is a great company. I really enjoyed working at Google. I thought it was an amazing experience. I got a tremendous amount of opportunity to work on very diverse things. I think for me personally, what's important is working with people that are smart and that are making a difference. And there's a lot of opportunity at Google to do that. But as companies get bigger, your effect on a problem space, your circle of influence gets drastically smaller. And if you are in management, like a director or a VP, then a big part of your job is to keep things moving forward in the same manner that they have been moving forward for the last three, four or five years. And so it becomes harder to innovate or make changes. You know, Google has tried many different products, but today search is still together with AdWords, their biggest driver of revenue. And cloud is catching up, but compared to other cloud companies, there's a big gap between Google and, for example, Amazon. And I think if you're within a big company and you work in a dynamic space like tech and you are entrepreneurial, which I am, then at some point you have a itch that you want to scratch, something that you want to do or try. And within a large company, you just don't have the affordance to do that. And that's what I liked about X because it gave many people with entrepreneurial desire or skills to try many different things. And X has produced quite some interesting spin spin-off projects over the years. But even X is pretty big now. And so it was a personal decision for me. I think Google is a great company. And so to answer specifically your question about my dream job, I don't necessarily have to work on something new or something that I think is going to change the world, but I do want to have an impact. I do want to see the needle move. And if you work, for example, in search or, or ads, getting a 0.5% increase or a 0.8% increase on revenue is really hard. And when you do it, you have to ask yourself the question, did I really have an impact? And doing that on a day-to-day basis in the startup is much easier. And, and that's part of the reason why I like smaller teams. So my dream job is working with smart people in a small team on a problem that's really hard to solve and then solving it. Wow, that's fantastic answer. You know, our students, right, many of them online right now are about to graduate. Many people give them advice is follow your passion. So it's a beautiful thing when a career and passion come together. But how did you figure out what do you want to do after school? And where did you start your professional career? I was very fortunate that I knew from an early age what I wanted to do. I got introduced to computers at the age of seven or eight and through various different types of computers. And at that time, computers had only eight kilobytes of memory. But the magic was there. The, the ability for you to program it was there. And I always thought I would become a doctor and prepared myself in high school and university to become a doctor. But ultimately, my passion was software. And so I was fortunate enough to grow up in a time when the software industry was rapidly growing. And I got into the software industry and, and has been very fortunate to always know what my passion is. And I have been a mentor to many engineers, UX designers, product managers over the years that have gotten into a career because it makes practical sense. You look at the job market, you work with an advisor in high school, or maybe you have exposure to these careers through parents or parents' friends, and you make the practical decision that seems like the best choice. And for a lot of people, there's no affordance for the passion piece because you may not even know what you are passionate about. And I don't think there's a right or wrong way to get into something. I think the important part is how do you measure if you're happy or not? And I don't think 
getting into your passion will necessarily be a direct correlation with happiness. The flip side to working on a passionate job could also be that it's really hard. It may not pay very well and you may ultimately end up being unhappy. So I think the real question needs to be, how do you measure being happy and what is the right decision on going there? And if you're young and you're in university, you need a network of people that you can depend on that will help you make this decision. Otherwise, it's really challenging. Mm, thanks for the advice. So your career development and uh, professional growth happen between large corporations and small ventures. So based on your LinkedIn profile, you spend almost equal time on each side. So how many large companies have you worked for? I'm originally from South Africa, and I ended up working for a large bank slash consulting tech firm. In South Africa, there at the time when I went into the job market, there wasn't a lot of software engineering jobs on the continent in general. And so you ended up either working in finance or transportation but I ended up working in the UK and then working in Canada. And I've now worked for companies like IBM Research, which is a division of IBM Corporation. I've worked for VMware and I've worked for Google. A big part of the reason why there's diversity in my career is because there's so much opportunity for somebody in tech or engineering to experience both sides of the coin. There's a tremendous amount of investment in startups in tech and has been for the last 30 years. And so that creates a lot of job opportunities. But then on the large corporation side, there's a real need for engineers. And that also creates a lot of job opportunity. And I've always kind of followed part of my passion to like work on interesting projects, but also looked at really meaningful opportunities within the tech space. And sometimes that landed as a startup and sometimes that being a larger corporation. It is two very different worlds, though, and I can understand why people might be interested in the contrast between the two. Yeah. Could you tell us more about the contrast from your experience? There are pros and cons to large corporations that are really important in the early stages of your career. Startups are almost like snowflakes. Every startup is different. And if you are lucky, you end up at a really good startup. But unfortunately, the startup failure rate is really high. And so the chances of you ending up in a startup that is going to fail is pretty high. And doing that early on in your career, a lot of people say, oh, that's fine. You have a lot of time to experiment and be successful. But in my experience, there's a lot of benefit to joining a large corporation and seeing how other people do it the right way. I was fortunate enough to work for IBM Research, and there was a ton of great examples of how to do software engineering and, and management. There was great examples of innovation within IBM research. And when you're young and you can absorb all of that at a drastic speed, that's really beneficial. Similar with Google, I, was, I landed in Google at a tremendous amount of growth when the company was growing very quickly. And seeing that is like a once in a lifetime opportunity and experiencing and learning from other people who are able to leverage that growth to do amazing things is very valuable to observe and to learn from. I see large companies as an opportunity for you to learn when you don't have the experience. And I see startups as the opportunity to have an impact, but if you have enough experience to know what to do. And typically startups are understaffed and have to move very quickly. And if you work in a startup with little experience and there's nobody to mentor you or show you the way, which is hard because there's a lack of time in startups, that's usually the scarcest commodity, then you're going to struggle. Then it's hard. And for a lot of junior people working in startups, they end up feeling frustrated and challenged on how to navigate within an organization that may not have the resources to support their learning and their own personal development, where if you work in a large company, typically that's already part of the organization and it's easier. Yeah, what a contrast, you know, these two words sounds like very different. Then how many small ventures have you started and what happened to those companies? Well, I've started three startups by myself and I've also been part of two startups before that. One of them succeeded and was acquired by a large software company, and that was in the 90s, and that is marked as a success. And then my second startup in the O's, we ended up not finding the traction we needed, and it failed. We didn't get acquired. 
and we didn't have a product that survived. And now I'm at a company that has been in business for five years and is doing well. And the team is very good at what they do in healthcare. And I'm very excited about having the ability to build a company from scratch that is uh, self-sustaining and starting to become successful. Some of the other startups that I've worked at, one of them failed miserably and the other one succeeded. Overall, my batting average is pretty good if you think that 90% of startups fail. But it's interesting because when people find out that you were at a startup, usually the first question is, did you make millions of dollars? And in some cases, yes, you make quite a bit of money. But in other cases, you don't because you the startup itself didn't succeed. And then their follow-on question is, well, what did you learn from the failure? And that's a complicated answer to give because it's not always clear why a company failed. It's obvious that they don't have enough money to continue, but the reasons for bringing the company to a point where they're unable to pay people's salaries and they have to close shop is not always clear. And that's what makes startups so interesting and why there isn't a lot of books on well, here's the one or two things you need to avoid to be a successful startup because it depends on the market. It depends on the team. It depends on timing. You may have a great idea and a great team, but if you're too early, you're going to fail. And that's a very common reason for startups not to succeed. Wow. So we will probably get dive into one of those stories later on. For now, I almost feel like you worked on both sides. Sometimes I feel like you worked hard on startups and then you went to a large company for vacation and then you come back, you know, to <laughs> work hard, continue that journey again. Why did you make those switches from the small venture to a large company and then come back? I want to make sure that in my case, I didn't slack off at large companies. In fact, I probably worked harder at Google than at some of the startups because working hard is a factor of the company culture. And for Google specifically, there's a lot of motivation to push hard and deliver quickly. It's woven into the team's culture or the organization's culture or even the company's culture. And so I, I've learned that it's not a given that if you work at a startup, you work harder than a big company. Some big companies, you work really, really hard. But I mean, the switch for me was not, I didn't see it as a big company or a small company. I didn't see it as more mature or less mature. It was about the project. I joined IBM Research because I was invited to work on a search engine. And I thought that would be pretty cool. This was like 2001. And I knew somebody that worked at Elmaden Research Center and they said, hey, we're looking for software engineers and your type of experience. So we're building a search engine to compete with Google. And I thought that was super exciting. I want to try that. We ended up building Watson instead. And it's not the Watson that's available today. It's the Watson that beat Ken Jennings on Jeopardy. It was a great experience and optimizing for the project was a really good decision. Similar to when I joined VMware, I wasn't looking to work at VMware. My startup had just failed. I was taking some time to do other consulting work and to learn about different industries other than tech. And I knew somebody who worked at VMware in the office of the CEO and said, hey, we're trying to do this ambitious project to do screen sharing and we want to run Microsoft Word on an iPad and you have virtualization experience. Can you figure out how to get word on the iPad. I said, yeah, that sounds cool. That's a real challenge. I want to do that. And we succeeded and it's a big business for VMware virtualization and app virtualization. And again, it was a good decision to follow the project. And I can go on. I mean, whether it's a startup or a large corporation, there was always some sort of idea that I was optimizing for. I think it's the nature of how I got into computers in the first place. I was attracted to the fact that there are cool things that you can do. And I've continued to use that as my fallback for making decisions. And it served me pretty well up to now. How about your current company? Could you tell us a little bit about that? And how do you like your job as a CEO? I worked at Google and I was responsible for a big part of the Google Assistant. I was part of the team that launched the Google Assistant to market both on the smart speaker, mobile devices. And a big reason why I was on that team is because I had all the experience from building textual analytics and networks and associations at IBM Research. 
which was back then not called machine learning, but you could classify it as machine learning. When I worked at IBM Research, there was not enough data or users to really deploy an AI to help. Not many people had cell phones and they weren't as powerful as they are today. So the market was not ready yet for an AI to be in the home. It wasn't the time for you to have Alexa in the kitchen. And then when Google Assistant came around and the project started and they recruited me to work on the project, the time was obviously ready because Alexa had already existed and was taking off and Google wanted to catch up with that market. So I was very excited about it. But a big component of it was how do we make money from this technology by selling advertising? How do we monetize the investment in the AI? How do we increase the top line revenue? At that point, I asked myself a question, do I want to work on AI to sell advertising or do I want to do something else? I had a strong reaction to that and wanted to really use the technology to help people. And there's lots of areas we can do that. Healthcare is one of them. There's a lack of people in healthcare. There's understaffing in nursing and administrative functions in healthcare. Healthcare is a really big industry in the U.S., we spend more than $3 trillion on healthcare every year, and it's the fastest growing part of our economic burden. It's also, the, unfortunately, the fastest increasing cost that contributes to our debt. I think there's a lot of opportunity for AI to reduce cost, especially on the administrative side, and to improve access to care for patients when there is no human available. I don't think there's a future where you would go into a room and talk to a box and it's replacing the doctor or the nurse. But I do think there are burdens on the doctor and the nurse that you can alleviate with an AI so they can focus on seeing more patients or being better at what they do serving the patient. And so I started a company. We ended up focusing entirely on healthcare. And it's been a really interesting journey because healthcare is a very tough market. It's first of all regulated, so it's challenging to navigate all the regulations as a tech, small tech company. And two, the buying process in healthcare is very convoluted. There are basically three big players in healthcare, pharmaceutical companies who make the drugs, payers, the insurance companies who end up paying for interventions, procedures, doctor visits, etc. And then the health systems that actually deliver the care. Most doctors in the U.S., and there's about 800,000 practicing physicians in the U.S., are associated with a health system. And so the only way to get care is to go through a health system to get to the doctor. The way that health buys technology is very different from any other company. It's complicated. It's a very in-person sales process. Sales cycles are really long, 6 to 12 months, maybe longer. And it's a very traditional business. And so having an impact as a small company is really challenging. And so all of those things lead up to, well, how is it to be a CEO? I would answer that question by splitting into two parts. Being a CEO of a startup is hard and can be lonely sometimes. There are a lot of decisions that startups need to make that you don't have specific personnel for. So in the beginning, you may not have marketing or you may not have a full sales team. Or if you do, they may be junior. And so you ultimately get to be the decider, which sounds really exciting, but can be very exhausting. Typically, even if you have co-founders, ultimately the CEO who reports to the board has to make the final decision. And raising money is always the CEO's job. He has to, or she has to ultimately focus on pushing the funding agenda. And that is challenging, even though it looks like from the press that there's tons of money. There's still a lot of checks and balances on getting venture funding into a company. So being a CEO is challenging and lonely sometimes, but it's very rewarding when you do have success. I think being a health tech CEO is a completely different job from what I'm used to being a co-founder in two previous companies. And if you're an outsider, it's even harder. This has been a very interesting journey for me because it's been very humbling. Success in a tech company doesn't automatically translate into healthcare. There's no guarantee. And in fact, there's very little that you learn from technology business that you can translate into a healthcare business. I feel very much like a junior CEO as opposed to a real CEO at the company now because there's so much that you have to learn to be able to thrive in healthcare. Yeah. I bet learning yourself is also exciting for you because I see that by listening to you for your experience so far, 
this is where the career and passion come together. You just provide a great examples for our students. When I actually reached out to you a month ago, that you were super busy. But when I mentioned my class, Innovation to Market, and then the Ocean Chat about the subject of entrepreneurship, you had no hesitation to taking extra curriculum. You know, much as you describe a CEO job, I'm also wondering how do you decide where to spend your time these days? That is an ongoing challenge. There are a lot of different ways that I can spend my time. But over the years, and because of my personal experience starting companies or being a manager or director in a large corporation, I've learned that it is hard to find mentors and good examples of good management style. The people who have dedicated time to help me progress in my career and in my learning have always had an ethos of giving back. And so I'm trying to repay what somebody else did for me by making myself more available to be able to share my experience and potentially even mentor people. I think that there are great schools out there that teach very important fundamentals in business management and product management to some degree, engineering, of course, but there are a lot in between the gaps between the, I, I would say, classical training and boots on the ground when you're starting a company. And even if you did have a really good class that taught you potential skills or tools to solve a problem, when you're actually in it, it's very hard to take a step back and see all of the possible solutions. And so having somebody there that can guide you through that process or even just being a champion for you, even if they don't know the answer is really helpful. And being pragmatic about education on startups and companies and what's the right choice for young people, I think is something that we should do more of. Fantastic. Thank you again for spending time with us here. I think it means a lot to our students. I would like to read a short paragraph from an HBR article. Here is the part one. There is an essential intangible something in startups, an energy, a soul. Company founders sense its presence. So do earlier employees and customers. It inspires people to contribute their talent, money, and foster a sense of deep connection and mutual purpose. So Kobas, in your opinion, what is the soul of a startup? I thought about it. I've read the same article. I think the soul of a startup sounds really cool because it's something that's like Twitterable, right? I think it's important to understand what that means. And from the prompt, the poll that's on the screen right now, it's specifically asking what is the most important piece that holds people together and lifts the spirit of the startup. I've been in five startups and large companies. Google has an interesting culture because every new project is kind of a mini startup. Android was kind of a startup. They were really well funded and resourced and left alone to do what they needed to do. Payments, similar. Verily, which was the medical device arm that grew out of Google X, was similarly very much a startup. In my experience, what has held together startups or small teams that are trying to innovate is the leadership. There's always one person forward and keep everything together. But what enables them to do that is equally important. I've seen a lot of leaders with passion and great people that have completely failed because they didn't have a good product. I have seen a lot of people who had great product ideas, but was underfunded and they failed miserably because they didn't have enough resources to execute. So in my mind, it's really three things. Do you have the right team that can build the right product or a great product with enough funding to be able to succeed? Later in my career, when I started after I left VMware, the very first project that I was on at Google was mobile payment. And our responsibility was to launch the first commercially available phone in the world that allows you to download your credit card to your phone and pay at a Whole Foods or a Walgreens. And it was very ambitious because at that time, there was no terminal infrastructure in the US that could do mobile payment. None of the checkout lanes at like an Old Navy or a Pete's would take the phone signal. And so the first challenge was we had to roll out payment terminals across the US to be able to make this happen. And of course, when we went to the payment terminal companies, they said, well, we don't have payment terminals that do this. So we had to actually build it for them. And then on the phone side, 
Google did release phones, Nexus phones with its own branding, but ultimately that was made by LG or Samsung. This is public knowledge. And so we still had to convince those companies to modify their phones to be able to build this feature. We would not have succeeded if we didn't have great leadership to push through all those challenges. And we wouldn't have succeeded if the product wasn't enticing for end users to actually use. And we had enough money to, for example, roll out thousands of terminals or modify phones. But I always told my teams that the most important thing for you to do for the leadership responsibility is survive your first birthday. Like if you can make it from launch to your first birthday after launch, that's a really good indication that you're going to succeed. And the startup statistics really back this up. A lot of startups fail in the first year or shortly thereafter. And if you can launch a product, find enough traction, make it for 12 months, then you have a very good chance of getting somewhere. But if you don't have enough traction or product market fit, you're not going to be successful. So one year anniversary, if that happens, that's a really happy, happy birthday. Yeah, I think it's a really important milestone for small teams and, and startups. Um, so I give you a little break, Cobra, so you can ask me a question if you like. Popular icebreaker question we ask at our company is, what is your favorite birthday meal or birthday dessert? I like tiramisu. Not only that tastes good, I think tiramisu also means a lot of love. So that would be my favorite. Oh, that's great. I, I love these answers because they're always surprising to see how people choose something that they, they only celebrate once a year. Well, that's a great question. Thank you. So Kobas, you have worked in many regulated industry, healthcare being one. I mean, you also worked on life science project. So tell us a little more about the challenges and uh, some of the maybe advice that you would afford our audience that how do they navigate within a regulated industry? I've worked in financial regulation. All, all the products that we shipped at Google for mobile payment was heavily regulated. And it, it wasn't just financial regulation, but also industry regulation. So the industry also have standards. Both Visa, MasterCard, Discover have different standards that you had to adhere to. They had their own certification processes. You couldn't, for example, download a Visa card onto your phone if Visa doesn't approve it. And for them to approve it, they had to make sure that the phone and the terminal works. So you can imagine how complicated it is if you go to an organization like Visa and says, 100,000 terminals in the US is certified. What does that mean? How does that work? If you want to work in a regulated industry as part of a team, make sure that that team has enough experience to succeed in that business. I wouldn't recommend joining a team that has no prior experience in that field. So if you're going to do something, for example, in mobile payment, don't join a team that hasn't successfully shipped a product in the financial space. But if you want to start a business and you lack regulatory experience, you don't have to not start the business. There are resources for you to go to. A lot of the regulated businesses, even though there are large companies that operate in them, and have their own regulatory internal function. There are tons of consultants and firms that specialize in helping you navigate regulation. For example, in healthcare, there are tons of companies that can help you set up a quality management system or help you navigate the FDA device approval process. And so it's not a barrier that should prevent you from starting a business, but you have to be very careful because bringing a team on board in a regulated business is much more expensive endeavor than starting a business in a non-regulated industry. That is probably the number one reason why companies in regulated or startups in regulated businesses fail because they underestimate the cost of building out the regulatory function and navigating the regulatory space in addition to building their product. And so it's kind of like, be careful on how you make that decision. Is it fair to say that if it's a regulated industry, if you're able to successfully manage the system and get your technology or your product into it, then that's a higher entry barrier for your competitors? Absolutely. Going through any regulatory process is usually very challenging and creates kind of a moat around your business that helps you be more sustainable. Something that's also very interesting about regulated businesses is that buyers of regulated software or hardware typically sign three to five year deals. 
if you operate in a regulated business, you can now look for money based on three to five year projections. And the investors are more likely to believe your projections because that's just fundamentally how the business works. And so it, enterprise sales have that reliability to it in regulated businesses that you don't find in other businesses. There's more of a loyalty to your regulated or compliant product. That's great. Before taking the leap to start your startup, did you participate in any accelerator or incubators? I personally not. So you have to take my feedback with a pinch of salt. I have been an advisor to a lot of accelerators and incubators. In general, I think it's 50-50 chance that it's a good accelerator or incubator. There definitely are some really good ones. But just like everything else, the outcome might, might not be great. I think the most important thing is if you're going to participate in Accelerator Incubator, be very sure of what the intellectual property rights are that you are agreeing to, because what you don't want to do is participate in Accelerator and then somebody else has an option on your idea. That's really important. If that's okay, I think if it's a one or two week Accelerator, why not? Maybe you learn something from it. Maybe you meet people. I think that's a really good benefit from accelerators and incubators. You might meet team members that you might not know in your natural network. You've got to start somewhere, right? And that's probably a good place to start if you have little connections. Which project did you find most rewarding or that you learned the most from? I would say the one where I learned the most in a compressed period of time was building a FDA certified medical device at Google. It was not a natural move for Google to invest in that area. There was no institutional knowledge about how to do it. Google had never built a medical device before and never met with the FDA. When the FDA heard that Google wanted to meet with them, they were shocked. They're like, what? So you guys built a search engine. I learned a ton because it was an extremely well-funded project. There was tremendous amount of leadership support all the way down from the CEO, and we could hire the absolute best people. And so the fire hose was really big. If you could sustain learning every day, then there was almost never a time when you walked away from work saying, wow, I didn't learn anything today. But every day was a, a mini mountain that you climb on learning. I guess that would be number one. Mm. Which project or decision didn't work out for you in the past and how did you overcome it? I think the hardest one for me was I started a company in the O's after I left IBM Research that's specialized in cluster computing and big data. I really believe that the future was big data and analytics. There was a number of companies that started at the same time. Splunk uh, is one of them in, in IT management. And we kind of, as a group, everybody who participated as like the founding team members really felt that that was the future. I put a lot of effort into it, but I also invested some of my own beliefs and my own ideas of what my future would look like in that project. And when it failed, because we were way too early and we, we didn't build the right product, it felt like a personal failure to me, and it felt like the future that I had predicted for myself or the future that I saw for myself was falling apart and that I would not be able to recover because where do you go after a failure like that? And I really had to rely on people around me to help me see that this doesn't mean that the next project is going to be a failure and that I shouldn't draw conclusions from it. But it was a tough time and it took a while. It took about two years for me to really process it and digest it and see the potential of what could come. And so when a project did come up at VMware, where I could, again, once again, work on an interesting technology, gave me enough confidence to think that this wasn't the end for me and there, there would be more. And so what, I, what the lesson I learned from it was recovery is very personal. For some people, they just bounce back immediately and it's, it's not a problem. For others, it takes longer and it's harder. And if you recognize, if you are self-aware enough that you are not going to bounce back, then you really need to look for help. You really need to ask friends, family, or even see a therapist on trying to process and overcome that failure. Because if you get stuck in believing that that failure mode is permanent, 
it's not worth taking the risk in the first place. And a friend of mine who's really smart once told me, you should never start or take a risk if you're afraid of failing because part of the process in learning is to fail. And you should do it because you're going to learn something, not because you want to succeed. Well, that's powerful advice. So besides this one, is there any other great advice that you have been given? Because you mentioned about a mentor a couple of times, you know, for startups. Yeah. As I became more adept at navigating my own career, every move that I made became less risky because I have more either career experience to fall back on or financial support. I was surprised about maybe eight, nine years ago when somebody came to me and said, so what? You are constantly building stuff. You are chasing, launching projects. You are building teams, but why are you doing it? And I said, well, I like to do it, but I was challenged to think about to what end. And the question that surprised me was, imagine that you succeed at everything you try to do. What are you going to do with it? And I learned that for me, I've never really put myself in that position to think, oh, I'm, I'm going to succeed. What do I want to do with it? And do I even want to? Is the success going to get me somewhere that I want to be? And so what I tell younger people who are on their way to being successful, and, in, and these days it's kind of interesting. There are quite a few people that are very fortunate. They start a company, the first company in their life. They just left university or maybe they even dropped out early. And within three or four years, they have a startup that is on its way to IPO. It does happen. It's super rare. Don't believe the press. It doesn't happen to everybody. The failure rate is 90%. But if I'm a mentor to somebody like that, I always ask them, so to what end, right? You have to ask yourself the question, if you are going to be successful, you reach your destination. What do you do with it? It's surprising how many people, including myself, have no idea how to answer that question. So I'm still working on it. I'm still trying to figure out what that means for me, but I think it's important to understand that if you take the first step in a journey and you reach your destination, what do you do with it? Yeah, I like the quote, life is a journey, not a destination. What you just described, I think it resonates a lot. So how do you finding the talent these days? You're a CEO of a startup. What are some of the sources of the talent uh, you're getting from? Online recruiting is very robust. So Indeed is the largest driver of tech company recruiting uh, in our experience. LinkedIn is closely second. And it's interesting because LinkedIn offers two types of products. There's the organic way of creating on LinkedIn, which is just exercising your network on LinkedIn with the connections you have, sending messages, using LinkedIn as a communications platform. But LinkedIn itself also has a number of recruiting products and tools. What's really interesting about the recruiting process these days is that post-COVID, or if we can call it post-COVID, the shift to, I want to work remote and that's how I want to be at the company. I don't want to come to an office is completely inverse of what it was before March of last year or even August of last year, because most people assume that they're going to work from an office. It's not even a question. It's like, I don't want to be a remote employee. I don't want to be a lone ranger. I don't want to work from home. I would say the vast majority of job seekers thought about the job market in that way. What working from home for a year plus has done, especially in the tech space, is now the majority of people want to work from home. They feel very comfortable with that environment. They feel like they've settled and found their happy spot at home. What does that mean for the future of a company? We have three offices in different cities. We intend to return to work, but we have a workforce that are fully grounded at home and happy. And when you're hiring new people, they're also saying, hey, I want to be remote forever. And so how do you build a company culture in a remote environment? I think that's really challenging. Also, tech staffing has just always been hard, but I feel like the last year has been extra challenging, especially hiring software or hardware engineers. I don't think that the U.S. is producing enough engineers to satisfy the demand. And what happened during COVID was very interesting. Everybody went online with their business. So restaurants now are hiring software engineers, like restaurant chains are saying, I need to hire software engineers. I was talking to somebody at a really large pharmacy chain in the U.S. and they told me, oh, we have 120 open positions for engineers. 
And I said, that's for 2021. They said, no, that's for this quarter. Wow. It's a pharmacy chain. They have pharmacies all over the US, but they're hiring 120 engineers. That's pretty crazy. That that would not have happened last year or the year before. That's because everything is drastically going digital. So it's a really good time to be an engineer, but it is very challenging to hire and connecting with candidates and getting enough time from them to tell them why they should join your company as opposed to the 10 other companies that's giving them job offers is hard. Well, thanks for sharing the trend. A lot of people are curious about post-COVID, you know, how would that impact the job market? You shared some specific things happening. So how do you describe a culture of a startup and what is the culture of your company? And are you hiring? Yes, we are hiring. I'll get that out of the way. We have a website where we post all our jobs. Of the five startups that I worked at, the culture in all of them were very, very different. Unfortunately, some of them were very dysfunctional. And I think that was pretty typical of a 90s or zero startup. Uh, in the 2000s as to have a large component of the mm. company culture be either dysfunctional or borderline toxic. And it's typically because people with very different backgrounds and mindsets come together to start a company. These days, I think it's changed a lot. Startups and startup teams have grown up to know that they need to invest in culture, values, and people development. So I think it's a lot better, but still there's a lot of diversity so what, what I think is super challenging is if you are considering joining a startup and interviewing for a remote position or even an office position, learning about the culture, how do you do that over Zoom? How do you do that in four or five interviews? I think that's really challenging. Our company has values that we try to instill in, in our day-to-day -day work to make sure that when we do have issues with the product or we have challenges with the customer or something goes wrong, that we can fall back on those values and understand how to use those values to solve the problem. When everything goes well, it's great and everybody is happy. But when you do hit those bumps, which happen, what do you fall back on to be able to solve the problem? There's always experience, but even the most experienced people can be difficult to work with. Some people are entitled. Some people are not great communicators. I come from software engineering. I wasn't a great communicator when I first entered the job market. I was terrible at communicating, but I had to learn that skill. So if you can't rely on great communication or great leadership, how do you solve a problem at all levels of the company? Well, that's the values of the company and the culture. And so that's, that's a long topic, but uh, we try to maintain a healthy culture and we try to do it in this really remote environment, which is new for all of us and we're still learning every day. Do you think there's a correlation in between the jobs at home and the pay rate? There is definitely trends that's emerging. So we import a tremendous amount of job pay data to be able to make successful offers. One of the worst things you can do is invest in interviews, five or six hours of interviews. And when you get to the job offer process and you don't make a successful job offer, you lose the candidate, right? So all of that time is wasted. We, we also try to have the compensation conversation right at the front. And then people are like, this is weird. You haven't even interviewed me and you're trying to set expectations. So the natural inclination or the preference for candidates is to hear about money and benefits at the end of the interview process when they're more receptive. And so the trends that's emerging from all the data that we import is really strange and all over the map. For engineering functions, software and hardware engineering, there is a very robust baseline of pay. and uh, Offers all look very similar and they're all trending drastically upwards. And nowadays, companies are hiring hardware and software engineers without any affordance for at home or in office. The pay rate is just standard across the board and there really isn't a difference. But in other functions like call center operations, for example, or administrative functions, finance, there are two types of offers that you're seeing those for permanently work from home and those for in office, and they're significantly less for permanently work from home. So the more traditional roles that are not highly competitive, we are seeing a trend emerge where 
there's a gap between the work from home and the in-office positions. And companies are specifically hiring for remote positions for the purpose of saving money. And the intention for companies usually to hire engineers is to expand their engineering force and to meet engineering demand. And so they don't try to save money. They just try to fill the position. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, no, that's perfect. And not only that, uh, you explained uh, what are your observation of the trend as well as the rationale behind it. Thanks for that. I'd like to conclude our talk today by asking the very last question that for those students who are getting ready to graduate and move on to the next chapter, what advice would you like to share with them? I'm not an expert at some of the other markets. I know some about healthcare recruiting, especially doctors and nurses, because we work in that area. So I guess what I would say is internships are still a really, really good way to learn about companies. Don't expect to learn something from the actual internship job, but having the ability to be in a company and then learn about all the other stuff is really valuable. So while you're an intern, for example, you could learn more about the job offer process. You could talk to HR or other people who recently joined the company and get their feedback and experience about how was it to enter the job market as an applicant and then how they convert it into a full-time position. But if an internship is not time is not available or maybe it doesn't fit into your timeline, I would say don't underinvest in researching companies. Research on a set of questions that you think is important to you to ask during the interview process and drive really hard to get those answers. So give you some examples. Ask about the company's approach to remote and in-person culture. How are they going to maintain the culture of the company with so many people remote? Because that's kind of the status quo now. Most, most organizations are work from home. Maybe you care about your career. Maybe you're thinking that you will be at the company for three to five years. Ask about how they do employee evaluations. At what cadence do they do it? How do they decide what, how to pay out a bonus, for example? These sounds like obvious questions and you may feel insecure asking them, but you really need to do your research on where you join because it's a wild west we live in now. And some companies are thriving with this remote workforce, but most are struggling. And I don't think you want to dedicate six to 12 or more months to finding out that it's not a fit for you. So focus on as many questions as you can think of that's important to you to make sure that it's a good fit. And don't just look at the job offer and the pay. Yeah, the interview process is almost a matching game for on both sides, right? Yeah. And the company. So thank you, Kobus, uh, for spending time with us and sharing your incredible journey. And we really appreciate it. Great. Thank and thank you for having me. Have a great day. Thanks for listening to Oceanside Chat. We hope you enjoyed this conversation. If you liked it, please share this podcast and stay tuned for our next episode. We'll see you later.